All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. If you're joining us uh, um, concurrently as we, we do this live, or if you're joining us in the recording that we'll be posting afterwards. My name is Justin Villery with the Committee of 70. Uh, our, if you're not familiar with uh, C70, we are a good government, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Based in Philadelphia, we do statewide work. Uh, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about today uh, is our Can We Talk program, uh, which um, we've uh, partnered with uh, Chris Atula, who I'll introduce in a second, uh, and his colleague Harris, Harris Sokoloff for um, about a year now uh, on a program that's been extremely successful uh, in the college space and college campuses. And we're starting to bring that down into the high school level as well. Uh, and so what we're here to do today uh, is talk about what Can We Talk does, um, why it's been so successful. Uh, and then how uh, high school teachers can implement some of its uh, programming uh, and principles into their classroom. So um, I'm going to introduce Chris Atulo, uh, uh, who is the founder of, um, of Can We Talk, uh, uh, and the co-founder and co-director. Um, I should also note, uh, as Sam flashes those slides up, um, uh, that uh, this program is co-sponsored by the PA Civics Coalition, uh, uh, which is a, a group of uh, nonprofit organizations uh, uh, around Pennsylvania who are focused on civic education. So for Civic Learning Week this week, this is what C70 is doing, but there are a lot of other programs that are going on around the state and around the country. Uh, so I invite you to check out pacivics.org. Uh, but yeah, I will uh, in a second turn it over to Chris, who will introduce uh, our panelists um, uh, around uh, uh, this really exciting program uh, that is designed to foster habits of productive civil dialogue and effective engagement. Uh, around issues that some people might be afraid to touch, but uh, with uh, a uh, effective use of some ground rules and strategies for active listening, uh, effective engagement and conversation um, can really start to ail some of the, the ills of polarization that uh, impact our country. So, um, Chris, I'm going to hand it over to you, and it's been a pleasure working with you and excited to hear from your, uh, your moderators as well today. Great, Justin. Thank you. And thanks, Sam. Uh... Just as I said, I'm Chris Satulo. Uh, I'm a former journalist who uh, about seven or eight years ago helped found the Can We Talk program, uh, which we'll tell you a little bit about today. Uh, so we're going to review uh, what Can We Talk has been doing on college campuses since 2017. Um, we're going to talk to a couple of students who've been very involved with it uh, since nearly the beginning. Um, you can see them on your screen there. I'll introduce them uh, more thoroughly in a moment. And then after we talk a little bit about what their experience of Can We Talk, the course uh, and the event uh, has been and why they decided to sort of join us uh, long term as uh, very uh, important moderators uh, working with us. We'll talk a little bit about the high school program, what it is and how you might be able to implement it in your classroom. So let's move forward, Sam, if we can. Um, you can ask questions anytime um, during uh, this webinar and particularly during the, the Q&A panel with the students. If you want me to forward a question to them, just type it into the Q&A on your screen. Okay, next slide, please. So can we talk? Uh, the high school uh, program aims to give teachers a, a set of flexible resources that they can use in their classroom. These are class exercises, lesson plans, discussion prompts um, that some teachers around the state of Pennsylvania are already using to foster better classroom conversations with their students. Um, the program overall, both at the college and high school level, seeks to introduce students to various concepts and practical skills that contribute to productive dialogue with a focus on giving people more confidence, uh, a greater sense of uh, security and less anxiety when attempting conversations with people who come from different backgrounds or have very different views. Uh, we also offer students regular opportunities to take part in, in the case of the college program, nationwide structured moderated dialogues um, with fellow students from across PA. Right now, the high school program is focused on Pennsylvania and we're aiming uh, towards the end of April to have our first statewide dialogue uh, on Zoom for students from high schools across PA. Uh, and one reason we're doing this, of course, is we're looking to expand the program, doing this webinar, 
we're seeking teachers who'd be interested in participating in this pilot program, this launch of uh, Can We Talk at the high school level. Important point is that when we do a training session at your school or with teachers from your school via Zoom, they're getting Act 48 credit for that because Committee of 70 is certified to offer that. For the lead teacher in each school, we're offering a $500 per school year stipend for um, their work as sort of the point person for their school and being the main contact with um, Can We Talk. You want to move forward, Sam? Thank you. So just to review the uh, the backstory a little bit, uh, we began at the University of Pennsylvania in 2017. Um, that year is not by accident. That was after, as you may recall, a very uh, contentious and divisive presidential election, which had had its impact on the Penn campus. Uh, I was uh, contacted by a friend of mine who's a professor there who said he was really alarmed uh, at the level of anger and tension and anxiety, particularly among um, more conservative students at Penn. Um, so we began to construct this way of bringing students of different viewpoints together and basically teaching them how, once again, how to talk with one another. Since then, we've done dozens of these, um, reaching more than 1,200 students from more than 40 colleges. One good thing about the pandemic, there wasn't much good about it, but it taught us all how to use Zoom, and Zoom enabled us to uh, dramatically increase the reach of the program. Um, since we began to work in 2017, we've been featured in articles and those publications that you see there. And as we mentioned, we've launched the high school program uh, just at the beginning of this school year. Right now, we have eight high schools actively involved with more than 30 teachers who have gone through some sort of training workshop, and many of them have begun using the resources in their classroom. So that's the rapid fire uh, review. Um, the best way for you to understand um, how can we talk works and how it might benefit you as a teacher and your students is to talk to some of the students who've been involved with that. So let's meet them now. Next slide, please, Sam. Uh, go, go ahead, another one. Um, we'll come back to that. So with us today is Connor Gibson, uh, who's a graduate of UPenn Wharton, is now out in the real world uh, working as an entrepreneur. Soraya Walter is also a UPenn Wharton graduate. Uh, the two of them uh, took our Can We Talk College seminar course the first time it was offered back in 2020. Um, and they have, because they were part of that course, they also took part in several of the early uh, Can We Talk uh, inter-campus forums. And since then, they've worked regularly um, as moderators for the program, themselves leading uh, breakout group discussions whenever we hold a Can We Talk. Megan Gupta, uh, took uh, the class when we offered it at Drexel a couple of years ago. And since then, she's also jumped in, got training as a moderator and now works regularly um, with us. We held an event last week for about 75 uh, students from eight different campuses and uh, Connor, uh, Megan and Soraya all worked as moderators on that. So let's meet them all. Uh, Connor, say hi. Hello everybody. Megan. Hi everyone. And Soraya. Hello, everyone. So uh, first question I want to throw out to you is, having all taken the Can We Talk seminar, which goes uh, sort of deep into American history and the, the roots of civil dialogue and um, the struggle to maintain America's political conversation as civil as productive, um, what might be one concept that you learned in the course that still sticks with you today that you still kind of have rattling around in your brain and use? Connor, I know you had something you wanted to begin with. Yeah, for, for me, the, the the course concept that has stuck with me and that I've used um, quite frequently since, since taking the class and also as a moderator is to explore or to start conversations with looking for points of, of agreement, of broad agreement, because it often makes um, your counterparty or those who you're talking with far more receptive to the points of disagreement that you'll eventually bring up. Um, so as a participant in Can We Talks um, during the class, um, I watch moderators over to me um, do this very effectively because it allows the group to build a sense of comfort and familiarity with each other because they realize that on, on big picture topics they may agree, but it's only in the finer points um, where there may be some disagreements. So if you can find a point of agreement um, at which to start, it allows the discussion of where, where paths diverge to go a lot more smoothly and for people to be much more receptive um, during that conversation. 
Thanks, Connor. And of course, the, the normal mode, the default mode of American political conversation right now is to go right for the point of disagreement and to basically frame the conversation around that, which leads discussions in a different direction. Uh, Megan or Saray, you want to jump in, either of you, on that question? Um, sure. Uh, I think one of the things I learned from the course that I took with you and Harris was uh, really utilizing the ground rules. And I, I think it was one of the slides that was skipped earlier. But the one ground rule that really sticks with me as as a health student is um, is acknowledging the people that are not in the room and maybe potentially being a voice for them. Um, I think in the previous um, can we talk that I moderated? We had there were a lot of different conflicting viewpoints on one of our prompts, and um, using that using that rule and bringing in someone else's space who wasn't present in the conversation, I thought that really helped. Um, I mean, stir the pot for lack of a better phrase, and also um, provide some sort of an education on there are these other viewpoints that are also available and present. Great, Megan. And sorry, I want to bring in a second. I just want to underline something. These are the can we talk ground rules, which we use and share um, at every forum that we do and are also part of the package of resources for high school teachers. Um, and there are a lot of sets of ground rules out there, and you'll see some similar points um, in uh, many other sets of ground rules as, as in these nine here. But I want to underline two things. One, the third ground rule. Um, which a lot of students have told us when we do uh, about when they do evaluation surveys after a forum that this is the one that struck them. Disagreement is fine. Don't try to paper it over and don't try to win it. Explore it. We're trying to reassure students that disagreement is um, actually an opportunity for learning, for growth, even for conversation to get fun. We find that students are so afraid and anxious about disagreement that it has a chilling effect on conversation and. All these ground rules are seeking to create what we call the brave space. Um, it's not in opposition to the idea of a safe space, but we think once we've created ground rules and other circumstances for a conversation not to run off the rails or become uh, demeaning or violent to anyone, within that safe space, we want people to be brave. Um, brave both in the sense of what they say and brave in the sense of what they're willing to hear and to sit with and to struggle to understand rather than immediately reacting to shut down people who've said something that's a little different from how they think. Uh, Soraya? Yeah, thank you for that, Chris. I just wanna build on what you said by saying, I was actually going to say that it's the, the safe space versus a brave space that I've taken with me. And um, not to, uh, I agree with you, delegitimize the understanding of the safe space, but to really get to the heart of why we disagree, to really get to the heart of why there are issues or conflicts that have persisted for years, decades, even generations, we have to allow ourselves to understand that bravery is needed and the brave space goes so much farther than the safe space by allowing people to be, I guess, authentic or even um, more reflective and empathetic in their res both responses and listening. So I think that uh, the brave space is something that I've taken with me and I try to create a brave space everywhere by modeling what I want to see, which is not just um, authentic expression and honesty, but also empathetic listening. I realize that um, speaking has to be balanced with listening. And I think that's what really creates that brave space where people feel not only safe to engage, but also safe to disagree without there being any harm. When you try, Sura, to uh, model that idea of the brave space in the spaces where you're working and where you're going now, uh, what's the response like? How's it going? Yeah. It's definitely pretty tough. Um, it's one of those, so I work in the diversity, equity and inclusion field. I'm actually an entrepreneur in that field. It is very, very tough because there is also a war on that politically. There are a lot of um, different you know, uh, sides of the aisle, but I think the brave space is um, me understanding that someone disagreeing with my ideology is not 
them disagreeing with me and me disagreeing with their ideology is not me disagreeing with them. I think there's a bravery in being able to um, understand someone's perspective and try to develop empathy before seeking to respond or even react. So that's kind of how I bring the brave space into my work. It helps me to deal with the political polarization in my field um, by understanding that someone disagreeing with the DEI work that I do doesn't mean they disagree with me. They might not see it from the perspective I see it from. And then I can um, create that space for us to be both brave and honest, but listen and, and, and see if we can find a middle ground. Great. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, Megan, Connor, did you want to jump in on the brave space or anything else about the ground rules? I, I can hop in here. Um, so... As Ray said that well, the, the other ground rule, um, the importance of listening um, and, and particularly in pausing. So though it, it sounds so simple, but uh, oftentimes before taking the class, when I'd be engaged in conversations, particularly difficult conversations, um, as I would be you know, in a conversation with someone when they were talking, I'd already be thinking through how, how I respond. Um, but one of the, the key lessons of the class is that you, you don't do that. Um, you, you really try to internalize what is it they're saying to you? And then you can take a, a few moments to pause, gather your thoughts, and then respond. Um, so it, it both slows down the conversation and as well as allows you to be more effective um, because you've internalized again what, what you've heard. Um, so that I've I've encouraged my participants as a moderator um, to do that and to use that technique. And I've used it to great effect in my own life. Great. So uh Think back to your first experience going to one of our inter-campus uh, student forums. And I will admit to the group, the reason why you went to that first one is because it was an assignment for me. It wasn't, it wasn't a choice. But can you recall what your anxieties or your thoughts were going into it and then what the experience was the first time you were at a Can We Talk forum? Anybody can jump in. Megan, maybe we should go with you. Sure. Um, so I was a senior undergrad senior. I'm currently a grad student right now, but I took um Kristen Harris's class when I was this um undergrad senior. And I always wanted some sort of knowing like validation from people or just knowing that what I'm saying is going on the right track. And I think that is a really difficult skill to unlearn. And I definitely unlearned that going through this process of being a attendee and a moderator. Um, so at my first Can We Talk, um, it was pretty, it was pretty um nice because we all agreed on the same um viewpoints of, of the topics. But I think what was interesting and what brought my anxiety up initially was the moderator uh would bring in those counter viewpoints and um, and that would make me more anxious, thinking if I say something, then I will look bad in front of the rest of the group. But I think as I slowly, and therefore I didn't, I didn't express my viewpoints. I was too scared and too shy, and I thought that I needed validation, and I wouldn't receive that from the students in the group. But as I have gone through the process, I realized that that's not important as long as I think was uh, echoing what Soraya said, as long as you're in a brave space with these rules, ground rules present, I think um, it's very easy to be honest and open about your viewpoints. And um, yeah, I would like to echo ground rule three again of disagreement is fine and we have to explore it because that's when we get to learn from each other more, get to understand each other's perspectives more and the root causes of where those perspectives came from. Great, thank you. Now, I'm just watching the clock. So I did want to get to um, the decision all three of you made to sort of stick with the program after your participation in the, the seminar was over and you already had your grade. And you all decided to, to stick with us and to learn how to moderate and then to have the experience leading breakout groups yourself. So um, can you talk a little bit about what it's like for you, um, uh, why you do it, and what it's like for you when you're in charge of the conversation, Soraya? So you're nodding there. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I think for me, it moderating is fun. Like I actually like to be the fly on the wall for these sort of conversations. Um, I also had the privilege, and some people would say the struggle, of being at Penn during the 2020 election. So we were, even before Can We Talk um, had popped off, we were having these conversations in dorm rooms, um, at dining hall tables, in club meetings. So it gives me this opportunity to, uh, even as someone who's graduated, still be involved and still 
um, learn from so many other people. So I think what really attracted me to staying with the program as a moderator is this opportunity to learn and help others put into practice what we learned those years ago, um, dealing with um, the political like polarization at the time and everything that was happening on campus. I was so grateful for taking Can We Talk in um, yeah, I think it was 2020 um, because I had the tools to navigate um, these discussions. So my goal is to help other people to uh, find the tools as well as refine the tools that I've already developed. And I think that's what really um, excites me about being a, a moderator. Great, thanks. Now, Megan, you uh, you flew solo for the first time last week after after being sort of a second chair with one of more more senior moderators a couple of times, which is how we break students into the process. And you had you had some challenging people in your group last week, right? Um, yeah, I did. I had a whole conversation with Chris and Harris about it, flew solo for the first time last week, and it was a very interesting um experience, I would say. Um yeah, I mean, there's going to be people in the group who who may not want to who may not hear, listen, or fall choose to follow the ground rules rules. And I think one of the things I learned from our conversation with Chris and Harris was making sure people are reminded of that, making sure that um, that people are listening to other people and not dominating the conversation, which is also another ground rule, or constantly enforcing their um, thoughts on or their viewpoints on other people. Um, obviously, that was an extremely um, that was a moderated situation. Like I was there as the moderator, but this could happen in real life. And I think knowing that you can, that these ground rules are easily applicable in these structured settings and in real life is why I also continue to um, to work with Chris and Harris. Great. Thank you. Uh, Connor, what's your most memorable moderating experience? Ooh, um, so, I've had had the the pleasure of moderating a lot of really different groups. Um, so some of them have been primarily composed of students um, in a pretty homogenous group where political views are are relatively aligned. Um, so in those scenarios, the the ground rule about considering voices that are not in the room is really important. Um, but there's been other times where students come from you know, wildly different backgrounds, both in experiences as well as viewpoint. Um, so so one of the most memorable conversations that I've moderated was a question on China and Taiwan and America's potential role um, in that situation. Um, so there were students there who were from Taiwan, there were students there who were from mainland China, and then there were domestic students um, from the United States who didn't know much about the situation. Um, so everyone, every party in that room was coming to that conversation from a very different background and like level of knowledge and, and upbringing. Um, so being able to, to you know, use everything I had learned in the class um, and build up in some previous moderating sessions um, to help walk and like, navigate that conversation was the most memorable thing I, I've done as a moderator thus, thus far. Great. Thank you, Connor. And thanks to uh, Megan and Soraya as well. Um, looking at the clock, I uh, want to respect your time. So Sam, if we could move forward and show people, yeah, a little bit more about the resources. So uh, what we were able to do, um, a little bit in the mode of building the airplane as we were flying it over last summer, but we were able to take a number of the concepts and the exercises and the uh, discussion prompts that we developed working with students such as Connor, Megan, and Soraya at Drexel and Penn and try to uh, revise them and make them workable in the high school format with the usual, usually less time um, that you as high school teachers have than we as teachers at a college level doing a seminar had. But to try to figure out what would work for a 20 minute conversation, a 30 minute class exercise, a 40 minute um, class exercise. So we've broken about 14 different ideas, 14 different basically resources and suggestions for how you can um, use the concepts of civil dialogue to go a little deeper on the material you're already planning to cover, the material that you really, the survey students have to cover before they take, you know, an AP exam or some kind of final exam for the year. Um, so uh, they're on our website. Uh, Justin, I believe, has put a link into the chat where you can sort of review them in more detail. But importantly, um, even in the early going, we've watched how teachers have seized a hold of those resources and begun to use them in their way for their class for the material they need to explore and to cover with their students. 
So an African-American studies class in West Philadelphia used our issue framing resource, getting uh, students to be able to see multiple viewpoints on an issue, not just a simple uh, mechanistic pro and con, but that there are, could be three or four or five different ways to address an issue. Um, she used that uh, for a class long discussion about what to do about Confederate monuments. So the students could see it isn't a binary choice between leave them there or tear them down, that there were a number of other things like put them in a museum or put a plaque on them that, that explains and interprets what's offensive about them. Uh, another in uh, somewhere in central PA in York County, an AP history professor used that same issue framing technique to help students understand the dilemma that faced Lincoln as he took office and Fort Sumter um, was surrounded down in Charleston, South Carolina. And they actually thought through three or four different options for what Lincoln could have done to see that the choice he made was defensible. Um, an English class act that was doing Lord of the Flies concluded that discussion of the book asking, well, how would that whole book have turned out differently if those uh, young people uh, isolated there on the island would have followed the ground rules? Another AP government class takes the prompts we send out on a regular basis and uses them for their Friday current events discussion. And that same Philadelphia African-American Studies class is working with us right now to use this issue framing technique to help the students discuss uh, different viewpoints on a new city ordinance that's been passed that bans ski masks. So you can see the variety of ways in which teachers have been using this. So uh, we'd be happy now to answer any questions anybody has if they want to put them in the chat. Um, generally speaking, uh, we're interested in any teacher, uh, talking to any teacher who wants to know a little bit more about the resources, wants to uh, explore how they might use them in the classroom, and explore how they might be able to give some students um, that they're working with an opportunity to be part of the broader statewide um, inter-school uh, dialogues that will be part of this program going forward. Justin? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, uh, everybody, the, the student moderators. It was wonderful to hear from all three of you uh, about your experience. Um, it looks like we had uh, one question in the chat. Um, uh, about uh, uh, bringing it to uh, Temple University. Uh, so Beth, I would certainly invite you to reach out to Chris. His email is right there uh, on the chat um, uh, to bring this to the uh, College of Education at Temple. Um, but yeah, any other uh, participants who are viewing this live or uh, viewing it um, uh, on YouTube, we'll put these links that we've been dropping into the chat uh, in the video description uh, so that you have this. But um, yeah, it was great to hear how uh, you all are uh, using this in high schools and how this is growing um, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the state. So um, Quick, quickly, Justin, we have one yeah. more question from Margaret. Are there any requirements about how many lessons uh, need to be utilized and by what day? It's a great question, and I'm delighted to answer. There are no requirements. Um, this is purely a free resource for you as a teacher who knows your school, your school district, your students, your curriculum, and you know the demands on your time. Use it any way you want, okay? Um, and we're here, and and you know some of the examples I gave you, uh, we worked with those teachers, like getting on Zoom in the morning during their their free period or their planning period. They sort of talked through what they were hoping to accomplish, how they were thinking about using the resource. We would give them some feedback and some ideas, and then it was up to them to deploy it in the classroom. But i um, pleased to say we've had some pretty good experiences with this already. I was able to, to go to Susquehannock High School in York County to see that AP teach, teacher do the lesson um, on Lincoln with three of his classes, and it was really a, a joy to be there and to watch him evolve the lesson through the course of the day based on the feedback we were giving him uh, as he taught it. So. That's ideally uh, what we hope to do. And we also uh, don't assume anything we've offered is perfect in the state right now. We wanna get feedback from the teachers we're working with and iterate constantly to make um, these, these exercises, these resources a more practical benefit to the teachers we're working with. Margaret also asked a follow-up. Is there a tentative date for the uh, statewide conversation? We're working on that right now, but I think April 25th is is uh, the leader in the clubhouse right now, Justin. Right? That's right. We're also hoping that we can do uh, one in the fall as well. Um, so if it doesn't work out for the spring for you all, then 
please keep in touch because we'd love to do it uh, in the fall. And on April 25th, I would hope and expect uh, if, if it works out that Connor, Megan, and Soraya would be there as among the moderators working with the students. And just to confirm, Chris, what does this cost for teachers to participate? I believe the number, uh, let me think, I'm adding it up, I'm turning up my brain, nothing. nothing. All right. We're funded through grants. Um, through, so it's this is entirely free for teachers to use. So. All right. Um, so that all said, um, thank you very much for joining us. There is going to be a series of webinars um, that are occurring throughout the rest of this week uh, through other uh, programs that the Committee 70 and PA Civic sponsor, uh, including uh, on Wednesday, our uh, Democracy for Kids program. This is for young people as young as kindergarten who, you know, uh, um, they're not getting into the, the nitty gritty of democracy issues, but they do. Um, many of them uh, have shown a really, really a strong appetite to learn how to engage in their community. What does it mean to be a, a community member and uh, make decisions that uh, allow you to feel like you have a voice? And so our lead educator, Ann Spector, um, uh, has created some really, really um, useful tools around literature um, uh, in kids' books that uh, help kids think about themselves as active participants in their local community. So we invite you to invite all elementary and middle school teachers to uh, to participate in that webinar. Uh, and then on Thursday, uh, at same time, um, we are going to be going through several other uh, Committee of 70 uh, youth civics resources, including our mock election, uh, including our Studio C70 interviews. Uh, and as you can see, we've got several esteemed guests who are going to be joining us, uh, including uh, Philadelphia Council Member Ru Landau, um, uh, who has participated in the candidate interview, interview process uh, with our students in classrooms. So um, you can uh, reach out to us again, use my email. Um, uh, to uh, uh, learn more about these programs or join us on those uh, on those webinars. So, uh, but that's it. If there are no other questions, anybody's if anybody has any last second questions, you can drop them into the chat. Um, otherwise, or drop them into the Q and A. Otherwise, I will throw my email in here once again. Um, but thank you, Megan, Soraya, Connor. Really appreciate your your perspective, and thank you, Chris, for your work on this program, and thank you, Sam, for running the show here. So. That being said, uh, thank you all. Have a wonderful evening.